What do you have to experience before you can say, finally, I'm living? What do you think living really is? The only thing that makes sense is what Paul says. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The more you live for him, the more you realize, I'm so thankful I don't have to know that I'm not in charge, that it's Christ who's leading. I'm so thankful that he's the one that gives joy and peace. Because Jesus is the key to joy. If you do have your Bibles, grab them and turn with me to the third chapter of Philippians. And as has been mentioned, we are in a teaching series, just taking it chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through this book. And this morning we find ourselves in the third chapter, and it's our heart, our goal, our intention to kind of spend some time in the first 11 verses this morning. Um, you'll definitely need a Bible, be it in print or digital. We won't have the verses up for you on the screen, but there might be a Christian near you, who, if you don't have a Bible, who could say, hey, you can look, you can look with me, it's okay. So, um, you know, either through digital or print or through a friend, uh, follow along with us this morning as we're in Philippians chapter 3. And, and there's just so much content this morning that I believe the author Paul has a great intent to show and to share with us that Jesus really is the key to joy, that I want to jump right in this morning with verse 1. Look at what he says there. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. I feel like if you're a parent, you could have that plaque in every wall of every room of your house, right? Okay, it's not trouble for me to say this to you again. See, Paul loves these individuals to whom he's writing dearly. It had been at least 10 years since he'd seen them, and God had used him as the individual to see that that church work start there in Philippi. And as he begins to write, he says, finally... And he's only about halfway through his letter, and it's almost like he's just getting going with the goodness and the riches that really are in this letter to those that are in Philippi. But he says, finally, rejoice in the Lord. Not taking joy in what you have or don't have, who you are or who you're not. Where you are or where you're not or what you're going through or what you wish was happening to you in this season. He says, listen, don't take joy in your status. Don't take joy in your situation. Ah, finally, it's 50 degrees. Now I can be a nice person. No, 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 no. Like, don't take joy in situation or status. Salary. Take joy in the Lord. Not in what you can taste and touch and see, feel and smell or even experience, but take joy in the Lord. Why should I? Because in the Lord you're free. Romans chapter 5 says ever so clearly that in Christ... You're justified, declared righteous. Nothing is held against your account. Listen, hear me on this. No matter when it's 58 and sunny or 85 and 110 humid, you're still free. You're still free. Free from the power of sin. That's what he says in Romans chapter 6, that you're sanctified. You're sanctified. Not only are you free from the penalty of sin, Romans 5, you're also free from the power of sin. I mean, I don't know, if you've been saved for more than 15 minutes, you may have forgotten this truth, that sin has no hold over you. Jesus has broken that power. You can walk in newness of life in Him, so take joy. You're free from the penalty of sin. You're free from the power of sin. And in Revelation chapter 21, 
Not only do we know from the Word of God that we have been justified and sanctified, but Revelation 21, one day we will be glorified with Him. You know what I would say? You're forgiven, Romans 5. You're free, Romans 6. One day everything is going to be fantastic. Revelation 21. Take joy in the Lord. Take joy in the Lord, he says. And he says, it's no trouble for me to remind you of this. It's actually safe for you. It's amazing to me because Paul never seems to be at a loss for words. But here he doesn't remind repeating himself. He's already told those in Philippi to rejoice. To have this attitude of gratitude, so to speak. To have this resiliency of heart four times. He'll do it again three times. And in any and everything, it is good to be reminded of the fundamentals. Wouldn't you say so? Especially like when Halloween or whatever, like, okay, candy. Like Pastor John mentioned, all right. Got to be reminded of the fundamentals. If too many calories come in, they don't leave, right? They stay right here. You know, it's interesting. They say we only retain a small percentage of what we hear. 25% is the statistic. For a person that's in my situation, that's extremely depressing. It means like, okay, I, I did 100%, and I only remember 25. Like, I only remember 25. I'm, not, I'm hearing it too, you know? Like, 25% of what you hear, you remember, if you hear it twice. Isn't that crazy? That's why good teachers often repeat themselves. Paul is saying, you need this joy. Why? Because there's a lot of bad ways to think out there. You need to be reminded that, that my joy is in the fact that I'm forgiven and free and one day I will be fantastic. Why? Because there is an attitude out there today. And this, I'm just going to speak to those who would say, I'm, I'm a person of faith. I'm a Christian. Listen, you'll come across individuals who may not say this with their language, but with their lifestyle. They would say, you know, I, I do need to live for now. Because tomorrow's not promised. And you say, well, that's not bad, right? Well, life is ultimately enjoyed by those who have health and resource. It's what the world would tell you. So get all you can. Do your own thing. Own it. Live your truth in your life. This is creeping into what we would call Christendom. That's a bad way of thinking. There's others who would say, well, just don't go crazy, right? Enjoy life. Do as your heart leads and guides, Jiminy Cricket, right? But do it within reason. It's all right to join in and to indulge occasionally. Just don't do it too often. Or some would say, no, spiritualism. This is the answer to life. Undergo rituals. Adopt beliefs. Live the best way you can. This will give you a strong self-image and confidence that God will accept you. Just be as good as you can, and God will accept what goodness you can bring. And this is what Paul says. No, no, no. It's not live it up. It's not discipline yourself. It's not just don't go crazy. It's rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in Him. And if I were to kind of share, I think this morning I'd like to share three takeaway truths with us this morning. They don't necessarily alliterate. I just didn't do that this time, so sorry for those that are disappointed. But here's what I would say that Paul is saying in this very first section of Scripture. You can't live what you don't live in. You can't live what you don't live in. Do you know you're meant to live with the reality that you're forgiven, that you're free, that one day things will be fantastic? But you say, why don't I have that? Let me ask you a question. What are you living in? Like right now, I'm living in a short sleeve hoodie that you can get at Walmart for like six bucks. I love these things. I'm enjoying the benefit of it. I'm protecting you from that, which you don't really want to see yet with these lights, you know, like I, we're all benefiting from what I'm living in at this moment, right? Because I'm living in it. I'm getting all the benefits of it. Let me ask you a question. Where do you live? Where is this? What's going on in here? 
Where are you focused? Where are you fixated? It's evidenced by attitudes, beliefs, choices, decisions, examples, friendships, goals, habits, interests, joys, whatever. But I, I want you to do well. And this is why Philippians was written. Your mind, this is where it's fought. This is where it's won. Chuck Smith used to say that the battle of the flesh and the spirit is waged on the warfare of the mind. So where's your mind? Do you know that you're forgiven? And let go of the past. Let yesterday be yesterday. And live now. What is now? There's no sin that has power over me. I'm free. Well, I heard one person once say this and ask this question. Are you free? And if the response is, what do you mean? Then no, you're not. Because a free person knows when he or she is free. Are you free? Free to enjoy Christ. Free to live life to the fullest because you understand that sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is, sin is forbidden because it will destroy you. That's why. Don't be afraid to think outside the box and live life well, but never think outside the book. Live life to the fullest. And where is that found? In Jesus. Not only is this biblically accurate, this is logical. The designer says, maybe you should live life according to the, what you've been designed. Well, that makes sense. That's what you should do. Live well. But you can't live out. You can't live that which you don't live in. So every day... Put on Jesus Christ. How do I do that? Well, let me tell you a way to do that. There's a church that puts together this program, Monday through Friday, to help you get into God's Word. And I'm telling you, there is nothing that will renew your mind, restore your soul, revive your spirit, give you the nourishment you need like the Word of God. Chuck Smith, when he was reading Haley's Bible handbook, was convicted early in his ministry when Haley made this statement that every church should have a structured approach for its congregation to make their way through the Word of God. Now, that's why Calvary Chapel, one of the reasons, we're so adamant about just going through the books of the Bible. That it's not really about, well, what does the NIV say, right? Neil's interesting version. Who cares? Who cares what Neil thinks? Like, let's get into the Bible. That, that's what we want. But did you know that there's no mediator between God and you? That you have access to the Scriptures more so than any other generation ever. Did you know that there was one time where the Bible was written in a language that the people didn't speak, and it was actually chained to the pulpit? You couldn't take it with you. Now we have it on a radio station that you can listen to, in video devotionals, in a reading plan. Take advantage of it. Grow in God's Word. Spend time each day reading His Word and talking with Him. Because Rome wasn't built in a day and neither is your spiritual health. It's built over time. And let me say this. Well, let's not hear what I have to say. Let's look at what Paul says. He's because he's about to say the same thing. Look at verse 2. Look out, right? Like he says, live in. Live in Christ. Why? Because look out for the dogs. Now, who is this? Some guy, Randy, from some singing competition who's got like, he loves people. Hey, dog. No, no, no. Look out for the dogs. What? The evildoers. For those who mutilate the flesh. What is he talking about here? This isn't three different groups of people, but one group of people with three different names. These were the Judaizers, the legalists who said you had to mix a little bit of old covenant with the new covenant. Believe that all the laws and the ceremonies had to be applied and were necessary for salvation. And they taught that in order for a Christian to be truly right with God, well, the men wouldn't be stoked about this, but you had to conform to the Mosaic law specifically in circumcision. I don't know what the first century church was like, but how do you like know that situation? You know what I mean? Like, oh, that's the circumcision. I don't know. That's weird. But like, that's what was happening. Like, that was the big topic of conversation. 
Christians, are you following the Mosaic law? And here's what Paul writes about these guys. Look out for them. Not look up to them, that's what they wanted, but look out for them. Why? Because there were those groups, beliefs, practices who it looked a lot like Christianity. But as you lift the lid, it's really legalism and a works-based salvation. Let me share this with you. This is still true today. There are forms of godliness that deny its power. The Hebraic Roots Movement is one of those. It's a modern-day movement that would encourage Christians to go back under the shackle of the law. That's why Paul wrote Romans and Galatians. You don't have to do that. He says to watch out for the dogs. This, This wasn't a compliment. See, in that day, in that time... These weren't pets that cost more than your kids, right? They were scavengers. They carried disease. Think of hyena. That's what a dog would have been like in the first century. He's, now, anybody got a pet hyena? If you do, okay, maybe they're going to make a Netflix show about you or something, like Hyena King or something. But like, no, you don't have hyenas. Nobody does that, right? Um, no, he says, watch out for these people. Evil doers. What does that mean? They think they're doing God's work. By saying, well, how how are you doing? Are you measuring up? Are you giving? Are you tithing? Are you serving? Like, ooh. They're a pawn in the enemy's hand. The mutilators. Why does he say this? It's a play on words. If you know the Greek language, there were two Greek words that sounded like each other. One meant to circumcise and the other meant to mutilate. And this is what Paul does. Paul, like, holds no punches. He's like, those guys are mutilators. Like, wow, this guy is harsh. Why is he so harsh? Because I really believe that Jesus plus anything ruins everything. That that if you say, listen, it's Jesus, but also it's Jesus. Listen to me, it's, it's Jesus. He forgives you. He sets you free. One day he's going to make everything that is wrong right. Church should always and only and forever be about Jesus. It's his church. He paid the price. It cost pure blood. I don't have that. It's not my church. It belongs to Jesus. Why is Paul so harsh? Let's put it this way. He's going to unpack this in verses 3 through 9. Salvation is not by addition nor by subtraction, but by substitution. That's what salvation is. So what do you mean by that? Well, look at verse 3. He says... We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no. How much? Can we all say no together? No. no. No confidence in the flesh. I like that. Paul says don't worry about these guys. They're saying that they're the real deal, that they're the ones following after God because of their outward obedience. And he's saying, listen, we are the circumcision. How can he say that? Well, make a note of this verse, but Romans chapter 2, verse 29, this is what Paul writes. A Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. This is what he's saying. True salvation is something that is spiritual. It's something that happens with the heart, not with scissors, right? The world we live in, It's grasping for a sense of centeredness, a reckoning, a rightness. Are you following the critical race theory? That's what it's looking for. It's looking for recognition of that which was wrong to be made right to a certain degree. Now, there's other agendas, but this is what he's saying. People look to be identified as right by what they've subtracted or added to their life. I cut this away. Gambling, drinking, or smoking, or whatever. Or now I'm giving money or time to the church. We live in a day where there's a thousand ways to be on the path to heaven. But salvation is not about addition or subtraction, it's substitution. How do you know that? Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin, listen to this, to become sin. That's powerful language. God made him who knew no sin. I think of little 
Laney Louise Pearl, a little three-month-old that has the saddleback cheeks of a six-month-old, right? They just hang off of her. Innocent, sweet. God made him who knew no sin to become sin. That which you disgust, that which you despise, that which you read in the headlines of what people, you go, ah, that's just a grotesque. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you get this? Salvation is not by addition or subtraction. It's by substitution. Jesus died your death so you could live His life. It's new life in Him. It's not about living a good life. It's about the fact that you get the life of Jesus. That's what this is. And then verses 4-9, through nine, He drives this point home by giving Himself as His own example. In verse 4, He says, look, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reasons for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's like saying this, listen, if it was Jesus plus something, if that could get you somewhere, then call me king. Because I was Mr. Religion. And he starts to list some things that he didn't even have control over. Listen, this is a side point, but you don't have control over when you were born, to whom you were born, and where you were born. Perhaps God has design in that for some reason. And this is what he says about his own life. Hey, you know what? I, if you're following along in Scripture, was circumcised on the eighth day. You know what this means? Man, I'm born a Jew. Locals only. That's what he's kind of saying, right? Like I, am, I was one week old and then circumcised. Why is that a big deal? Because you could convert to Judaism and then you would have to go through the, the process of circumcision. He's saying, no, 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 I didn't do that. I didn't convert. I was born this way. Wow, that's okay, that's a big deal. He says, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Okay, why is that a big deal? Well, that's the popular crowd. The first king of Israel was from the tribe of Benjamin. Does anyone know his name? Does anyone know Paul's original name? So do you get who he is? He's Saul. Named after that first king from that tribe, circumcised on that right day. Man, he's cream of the crop. He's Hebrew of Hebrews. What does that mean? It means he spoke the Hebrew language. Well, why? Okay, what is that? Why? See, in that time, everyone wasn't a Hebrew. You remember these people called Romans. You ever heard of that? Like, they had dominated the world. You know what his family did? They resisted assimilation. They fought to stay true to their roots. And they paid for him to be trained under the Yoda of Judaism, Gamaliel. You get who Paul is. Look at, his, look at his pedigree. He says, as to the law, I'm a Pharisee. Now, in the 21st century as a Christian, when we think of Pharisee, we think, of, oh, those guys are dumb. They weren't dumb. These were the 6,000 of the elite. Their nickname was the separated ones. If you're a military guy, like, oh, those are the guys, that's strike force, or that's so-and-so, like, Oh, those are the tip of the spear. This is Paul. He's somebody when he walks into a room. They were the celebrities of that culture. He says, as to zeal, I'm a persecutor of the church. This was his resume. So why was, what's zeal? This was the singest highest virtue in the Jewish faith. It was this simultaneous love and hate. It means that you loved your faith so much that you hated anything or anyone that could threaten it. Zeal, what's the proof? He hunted and killed women and children and men who identified as Christians. You think Paul was lazy? You think he was inept intellectually? You don't think he was a worker? This guy was a threat to any room he stepped into. He was connected. He says, as to righteousness, he says, blameless. There's 613 laws according to the Old Testament. And this is what he would say. Line me up against those. I did fine. Now we know that in the the Ten Commandments it talks about coveting. He knows that he broke that inwardly. But outwardly, this guy checked every box. This is the guy you want to hire, right? This guy works hard. (laughs) He's from the right pedigree. He's got like five master's degrees. Like, this is our guy. This is it. What does he say about all that in verse 7? But whatever gain I had, 
I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth. Pay attention to that phrase. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Just to know Him and to be known by Him. May I see your eyes is better than anything you've ever experienced and can experience. Money can't get you this. Pedigree can't get you this. Your brains can't get you this. Your ruthlessness can't get you this. That's why he says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. He says, for his sake I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish. What, is he British? Like, we'll talk about that. In order that I may gain Christ. Paul says, I had everything. I had the world by the tail. That stuff's rubbish. What, what is this? What, what is this? What, is this where, why do we say rubbish? It's not a nice British word for the trash or the bin, you know. But it means excrement of non-human kind, of the canine kind. Don't you just love that when you're walking down the road and go, oh, there's some rubbish. No, you're not stoked about that. Like, why didn't that guy pick up his rubbish? You know, Think of that. When you think of anything being added to just surrendering your life to Jesus, it's a brown paper bag. Does that make sense? You may not know what that means. But Paul says, take it from a guy who had the religious pedigree. If his righteousness couldn't do it, here's the deal. Yours doesn't stand a chance. You think your good deeds are going to outweigh your bad? You measure up to Paul? No. And Paul realized, well, like he says in verse 9, to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. To be found in him. Did you know that the word in him or in Christ is one of the most frequently used descriptions of a Christian standing before God? You're in him. You're in him. You're in him. He's got you covered. You're covered. You're in him. To be in Christ means we've accepted his sacrifice as a payment for our own sin. One famous preacher of old used to call this the great exchange. That you lay down your rubbish and he gives you his righteousness. He exchanges our list of sins for his perfect account of being totally pleasing to God. I think, if I can, can I see your eyes? That's who you are. Don't you see that? That you're forgiven. God's not angry at you. He's not holding things against you. You're free. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting your enemy to die. You have to let go of bitterness of what she said, of what she's done, of what he did to you. There's something within us that would say someone needs to pay for what that person did. And Jesus with nail-pierced hands would say, I did, I paid for that. Let it go. Move forward. Be free. Be free. Because what holds so much of us back is the pain of perceived hurt, or even real, from another. And Jesus would say, listen, I paid for that. Be free. Be free. Know that you're forgiven. Know that one day everything's going to be fantastic. So the nightly news, if you you want, I guess. But read the New Testament. Wars and rumors of wars. Pestilence, disease. Earthquakes and fire. This is what's coming. But you're free. You're forgiven. It's going to be fantastic. So keep your head up. Keep your head up. Salvation is not addition nor subtraction. It's substitution. This is counter-culture. 
Everything else in life is like, well, if you need to get healthy, add this, subtract. I'm not against all that. I understand that. But salvation, substitution. The third thought that we'll think of today as we close out in verses 10 and 11 is simply this. My worst day in Jesus beats any day without Jesus. Verse 10 and 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's life went from pretty good to horrible, you know? Like he was like, I'm kind of in the in crowd. I've got the education. I'm, I'm the guy. Now I met this guy named Jesus and everything is not good. But everything's awesome. He lost his status, lost his friends, lost his job. Some historians would say he lost his spouse. That can't be proven, but it's possible. He can't really be the persecutor of the church and the writer of the New Testament at the same time. Does that make sense? Like, he had to lay down that old job description, pick up a new one. He had to die, count his life as forfeit. His pompous religious stance had to be seen as a loss. And his new life in Christ would be a life of difficulty, chains, pain. But also, as he would say, it's a surpassing worth of everything I've ever tasted. To know him, to be known by him, to be used by him, this is my design. I'm in the sweet spot. That's also available to you. God has purpose for your life. He has wired and formed and fashioned you to function in your design. And that's when you're most alive. It's what you want, whether you can articulate it or not. What you want is to live. And the best way to do that is to know the one who gave you life. And then to follow his enablements for life. And to let go of the past and to live in the present and let God take care of the future. This is how you're meant to live. Is it scary? Yes, because your financial margin is not that which gives you peace. It's your heavenly Father who gives you peace about the future. Can I trust Him? I think so. Or don't. Trust what only you can taste, touch, feel, smell, and put together. I would just say in my own personal life, When it comes to salvation and the gifts of God, I don't want what I can afford. Does that make sense? I want what he wants. I want what that he wants to give. And Jesus would say, listen, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added to you. He will take care of you. You can trust him. But is that scary? Yeah, that's life. You never know what's coming for you, but you know who's in control. This is what he says. It's like an honor to be entrusted with the pain and the sufferings to share that with Christ, to become like him in his death. When you surrender to Jesus, you don't just get forgiveness and freedom, but you get the promise of a resurrected life. The day is coming when everything will be made right. Now, His Spirit is making your spirit more like His own. Until that day when He will make us more like Him on the outside. You see, the central message of the book of Philippians is that Jesus is the key to joy. Jesus. At least 19 times in these four chapters, He mentions joy, rejoicing, or gladness. I'm not that smart, but I know that's a lot for four chapters. 19, that's a lot. Every week, we have this opportunity to gather together to learn how to live out these truths. Can I say that again? As we gather together, we learn so that we can live. Paul uses the word mind ten times, the word think, and the word remember 
for a total of 16 references to thought life in the book of Philippians. So again, not being that smart, I can at least put this together. You don't have joy, where's your head? What are you thinking? Is it accurate? You know, I think we should kill ants, don't you? Anxious, nervous thoughts. Those should die. You shouldn't believe everything you think. Ants, anxious, nervous thoughts. Where do I bring them? To the foot of the cross. Nail them there. Philippians 4 will show you how to do that. 16 times he uses the word mind. 19 times. This element of joy. See, we're learning something as Americans. We thought technological revolution would solve some things. We thought the advancements and the speediness of how we can make meals would be a benefit to us. The last hundred years have known progression like no other time in history, at least recorded. Why is it the most depressed nation ever? Why? Because you do not find life that is sustainable solely in things that are physical, emotional, relational, mental, monetarial. I don't think that's a word. Financial. You find it in your spirit. Now the rest of those matter. You can't just live physically any way you want and go, man, why am I not joyful? All these Snickers bars, what's the problem here? There's a problem there. You can't keep eating all that sugar. That's not good for you. But the core of who you are is the spirit. And this is what I'm trying to say. I agree with what Chuck said. The battle of the flesh and the spirit is waged on the warfare of the mind. Where is your head? Don't you remember that you're forgiven? Don't you know that you're free? And live that way. Live that way. Live that way. Know that it's going to be fantastic. Live that way. And remember these three simple truths from this morning. Verses 1 and 2, you'll never live out what you don't live in. So right, you know, put on Jesus. Get into his word. Grow with God's people. When you come to a gathering, learn God's word and sing, but also serve and give. It's not just about learning and singing. You've got to do the whole thing to get the benefit out of it. Gather with God's people. Grow daily in your walk with the Lord. You'll never be able to live out what you don't live in. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in Him. Point number two for this morning. It's verses 3 through 9 if you're a note taker. Salvation is not by addition nor subtraction, it's substitution. Aren't you so thankful that when it comes to God's righteousness, you don't have to receive that which you can afford? You get His righteousness, His goodness. And then thirdly and finally, verses 10 and 11, my worst day with Jesus beats every day without Him. I've had so many roommates in my life especially when I lived in California. But I'll never forget one of them named Connor. Connor's a brilliant guy. Um, brilliant guy. And he always used to tell me this. We shared a bunk bed in this little street called Del Monaco in Goleta, California. And he said, Neil, no matter what happens to us today, we're still going to heaven. And that's, that's right. That's true. That's the right way to think. That, that my worst day with Jesus beats any day without Him. Jesus is the key to joy. He's the only way. Now, we've said this before, but this is where we'll close, and I'll go ahead and invite the worship team up this morning to close us out. We're going to spend some time in communion momentarily. But Jesus is the key, right? K-E-Y. It may not be alliteration, but at least it's something, you know. Um, know, engage, and yield. That's how you experience Jesus. What do you mean? You've got to know Him. You've got to surrender to Him. And you have to walk with Him. You've got to live out that which He lays down. 
You, you can't just be like, well, that's cool. I'm going to go do my own thing. No, 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 no. This is written so that you can learn to live. This is why this is here. So that life for you can go well. What do you mean I'll have everything I want? My best life right now? Absolutely. But it's not going to look like what you think it's going to look like. That doesn't mean finances and fun and fitness. That's not what we're selling. It's forgiveness. It's a fullness of spirit. It's a steady mind. You can have that. You don't have to live life on loop. Life is a journey with God. How do I do that? Know Him. These truths, take them or leave them is what I would say. Live these things out. Like, like live in the relationship with God. Recognize every day that there's been a great substitution made on your behalf. And know that every day with Jesus is better than a day without Him. Live that. See what it does for you. That's the key to joy. Yield. Yield heart, head, and hands over to Him. Sometimes, just like you, I have a full day. Anyone ever had a full day? Everyone has a full day, either perceptively or really. That's what I've learned. Sometimes I have to break it down minute by minute. Okay, Lord, right now I'm knowing you. I'm engaging with you. I'm yielding with you. Sometimes it's hour by hour. Sometimes it's third by third. Morning, afternoon, and evening. That's how I navigate full days. Just take them in little bite sizes. And you may be facing something that you feel is overwhelming to your heart, mind, and soul. Well, I would say you can at least navigate the next 12 minutes, right? And the next 12 minutes, sing to him. Be reminded of the fact that you're forgiven through communion. And yield yourself over to him. At the end of this service, there'll be, there'll be couples and individuals up here that would love to pray with you and for you. And I firmly believe that prayer accomplishes things. If you're facing something that you would say, this is something I would love to have some support. We don't want you to come up here. It's embarrassing for you to come and receive prayer. People are going to talk about you. No, are you crazy? That's what the enemy would love to whisper in your ear. This is the best place in the world. See, people here, they didn't have to come here. They chose. So if you pray, they're like, hey, that's a good thing. They're not against you. And even if they are, who cares what they think? You know, think, talk to God. But anyway, um, at the end of this service, sing. Take communion. Be prayed for. Pray for someone else. Know him. Engage with him and yield to him. Jesus is the key to joy. But listen, God's the perfect gentleman. He will not force himself upon you. As has often been said to me throughout my entire life, God has a plan for you, but so does the enemy. And every day you make choices that align with one of those plans. Choose well. Choose well. Choose to follow him. Choose to follow him. Know him. Engage with him. Yield heart, head, and hands over to him. And I believe, as the word of God would say, you will see that Jesus is the key to joy.